us back, I would say. <laughs> sure. No, I mean, like... Um... In the meantime, we can welcome everybody who's uh, joining us for this uh, Six Cyber Agora and the uh, third already uh, on underground urbanism, if I'm not mistaken, Antonia? Yes, correct. So Frank is back. So uh, Frank, uh, yes, are to you to open on this Cyber Agora on behalf of ISOCO. Thank you, Han. Thank you, uh, Antonia. Well, uh, yes, it's 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 my pleasure to announce this uh, to open this sixth uh, Cyber Agora. Um, you know, it all started uh, with the 1.5 meter uh, city uh, back in, in in the beginning of the pandemic. We had a couple of wonderful cyber agoras uh, uh, curated by uh, Joanne Siliers. I don't know if she can be with us today. It's a bit difficult from her time zone. Um, uh, but since then, we had a very interesting cyber agora events, um, which is an open window. It's uh, meant for members of Isocarp, but it's also open uh, for non-members, uh, hoping that they will become members. So the same for today. Everybody is uh, equally welcome, member or not member, but of course, uh, we all hope that this will encourage you to become member or to uh, renew your membership. Um, so yes, this uh, 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 sixth edition of Cyber Agora is uh, um, again on urban uh, underground urbanism, which means this is really a very interesting topic, uh, appreciated by our members. And um, yeah, um, let me thank first, uh, except of of course uh, uh, Han and Antonia. I, I, I certainly would like to to thank Mario uh, for your support, Mario. Um, I know I, we will not be able to count on you any longer than uh, this month. Um, uh, so yeah, we have to to look forward to who will who will take it over from you and to do it uh, as good as you did, uh, together with your colleagues, of course. Marita is uh, is there. Um, I don't know if Kate is is in the room. I don't see immediately, but Kate has recently joined. Uh, uh, the Secretariat as our new uh, Office Director and Congress Director. So a very warm welcome, Kate, Kate Holmquist, the um, Thank you. You know, very you know, uh, uh, distinguished member, uh, uh, active for many years, uh, also in the Scientific Committee, and now uh, heading our Secretariat. Uh, that's really an honor for all of us. So good luck with that, and thank you for being with us. And then uh, let me... Yeah, uh, also at least to thank all uh, the speakers in uh, the room. And uh, I don't see yet the face of uh, Mahak. I hope you're there. Of course, uh, Mahak, you have uh, done so many work uh, to make this all happen. So uh, thanks to you all. Um, it's your, uh, it's your uh, discussion, so I won't uh, uh, take it uh, much longer. Only saying that, you know, what you discuss, um, is not purely of technical interest, um, but as the title suggests, we should also look for policy interest, uh, making the agenda uh, jointly. And I think that Isocarp and Itacos uh, together can make a, a very innovative point about uh, the, you know, uh, the um, uh, 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 untapped uh, uh, asset of, of going underground uh, for uh, several uh, good reasons uh, and, you know, gearing up uh, our joint contribution, uh, how to make that happen uh, when we are discussing New Urban Agenda Plus 5 uh, on 28 April in New York, when we are coming together at the World Urban Forum uh, number 11 in Katowice, fingers crossed that it can happen uh, end of uh, June, and of course uh, at our World Planning Congress uh, in Brussels, from wealthy cities to uh, healthy cities, uh, 3 to 7 October uh, uh, this year. And finally, also COP27 in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Egypt. Uh, um, uh, uh, so, you know, making our, our voice heard. And of course, it's very good to have a voice that is uh, evidence-based, um, uh, well-informed. And that is all what I want to say here. So. Uh, thank you in advance. I'm sorry I cannot stay until the very end, but uh, I hope that we will have a very uh, fruitful uh, discussion. So 
I would say over back to you, Han and uh, Antonia, to probably introduce the first uh, real speaker. <laughs> Thank you so much, Frank, for the warm welcome. Um, we love these uh, collaborations with, with ISOCARB. Um, Han and I are always um, set out to reach out to, to planners and to a lot of other professionals in the built environment who have not traditionally dealt with the topic of underground urbanism. And today we come indeed together to discuss um, the role of policies and governance in the sustainable use of the subterranean. I'm Antonia Conaro. I'm an urban planner by training and also the co-chair of the ITA Committee of Underground Space, together with Han Admiral, who is an enlightened engineer, as he calls himself, from the Netherlands. And together we have also co-authored a book uh, called Underground Spaces Unveiled, um, which we um, have published with the Institution of Civil Engineers in the UK, but which is also a book reaching out to all kinds of professionals in the um, arena of uh, sustainable development and urbanism. So traditionally, um, we have not paid attention in our city planning efforts uh, on the use of the underground space. And this is something that we're exploring today. So how can these concepts in the future be part of urban development plans and strategic efforts of cities? Over to you, Han. Thank you, Antonia. Um, uh, just a, a couple of remarks uh, to start off with. Uh, uh, housekeeping remarks, I, I would say. Um, you, you're all aware that this... Uh, this cyber agora is uh, uh, is being recorded so that it can be uh, looked at later uh, as well. Uh, if any of you uh, have objections to uh, um, to being seen, uh, then just leave your cameras off, and that should be uh, sufficient to remain in the background. Um, the cyber agora is is uh, a space where we want to. Um, um, give you new insights, uh, and, and our speakers will be will be doing that most certainly. Uh, but it's also a place where we can interact. We can do that in different ways. Uh, during or after each presentation, there will be a short uh, uh, question and answer. If if anybody has any questions, but at the end of the uh, after all the presentations, we have uh, at least thirty minutes reserved for uh, for discussions, and, and we hope you will all join in. Uh, and just to do that in a, in, in a little coordinated manner, you can either pop your questions into the uh, into the chat box. But as you're all present in this uh, in this meeting as well, you could also raise your hand, and then one one of us will uh, will just give you the uh, the floor just to to ask your question, which from the point of interaction is maybe uh, a better way than just uh, jotting down things in the chat. But uh, you can use either way, and Antonio and I will steer you uh, through, that, uh, through that process. As Antonia said, in terms of the, the use of underground space, uh, we, we see uh, uh, cities where they are looking at the use of underground space. And, and the way they, the, the reason for doing that is, is because they're running out of space on the surface. And um, if, if we take examples as Hong Kong and, and Singapore to name just uh, but two cities, uh, you can see that that is also then driving uh, policy um, uh, and, 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 and other research in order to, uh, to see what, uh, what the best ways are of uh, integrating the, the underground into, uh, into the uh, urban, um, urban environment. Um, but the reason for uh, that there are a lot of cities where this awareness, if you like, is still lacking or it's, it's kind of, uh, of, of dormant. And as we move on towards uh, thinking about sustainable development, as we become more and more aware of the effects of climate change, the need to adapt to climate change, but also the loss of biodiversity, um, there is indeed a growing necessity for cities to start taking their uh, underground space, uh, the spaces below the city to take it more serious. And that's indeed what we will be exploring today uh, in, in different ways. Antonia. Yes, and indeed, as Han has uh, pointed out, I mean, traditionally we've used underground uh, infrastructure for shelter, but also um, for um, services. And this is in, indeed um, now a 
um, changing in the sense that we are realizing there's much more potential in the underground than we've ever dreamt of. And we can, in fact, uh, ha reuse abundant structures in the underground. We can uh, revitalize uh, urban centers. We can densify by uh, integrating the subsurface. And we can even do things as outlandish as it may sound as growing food below the city. Uh, we can ameliorate climate change um, by using groundwater for heating and cooling homes. And for all that, for those new uh, innovative uses of the subsurface, we need, um, we need this uh, cross-disciplinary discussion and we need a cross-policy spatial dialogue in order to lead to a sustainable and efficient use of the subsurface in our cities. And, and indeed, the, the role of the urban planner in all this is, of course, is, is key to, to actually orchestrating what, uh, what Antonia and I uh, call the spatial, spatial dialogue and, and to take the results of that dialogue forward into the uh, urban planning process. And to do this, uh, new technologies are emerging in which we can actually visualize the subsurface uh, in, in three dimensions to make it all more approachable and also understandable, if you like, for uh, the, the decision makers and, and, and the policy makers. And indeed, uh, one of our speakers will uh, give us a, a, a very interesting presentation to show just how that can, uh, can be done. But the Cyber Accord is all about our speakers. It's all about interaction, as I said. So I think Antonia and I will, uh, will, will close with our introductory remarks here and we will start to move on to our first speaker. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a great honor to, uh, to introduce Raf Ilsbroeks to you. Uh, Raf is an, is an urbanist and uh, currently a PhD candidate uh, at the Research Group for Urban Development at the University of Antwerp in Belgium. Uh, he holds a Master of Urbanism and Spatial Planning and a Master of Civil Engineering Technology. His doctoral research uh, focuses on the analysis and the reintegration of automotive urban landscapes. And in 2018, he was awarded the BWM STR label by the Flemish government architect for his research proposal, Adaptive Reuse of Underground Car Parks. And this is indeed what he will be uh, talking to us about. Raf, the floor is yours. Thank you, Han. I will first try to share my screen. Okay, that should work. Uh, thank you for the invitation. I hope my screen is in full mode. Yeah, okay. So we did the research. We, that's Martin van Acker, professor at the University of Antwerp, and myself about the reuse of underground car parks. Okay, so we firstly uh, did an analysis of, of the spaces and we distinguished four elements, um, the cave, the ramp, the pavilion and the surface as the four constituting elements of, of an underground car park. But these are some more pictures of, of some caves to get in the atmosphere. So the limitations of the, the spaces today that we uncovered was some obvious ones like the limited dialogue with the urban scenery above and the limited heights and the limited daylight entrance. But more surprising maybe is the limited load capacity of the intermediate floors, which is just about two kilonewton per square meters, which is, is very low actually. But we also discovered some potential in, in many the bunker characteristics of, of these spaces in relation to, to city metabolism, if you think of, of in relation to water management, etc. Um, a specific remark on our research is that we, we did it in, in Belgium and Flanders with the specific um, yeah, hydrogeological condition of very high groundwater tables, which means that for multi-level underground car parks, in general, there is um, continuous drainage and pumping needed, which has repercussions for, for future residential uses, but also on, on the, an, an imbalance on the ecological and, and stability in, in the neighborhoods of these constructions. So then we looked at, at the actual adaptive reuse and we, we, we distinguished three scenarios in which we worked also with, with students 
during one year. So a first one is, is tactical urbanism, you could say, just light in um, light in, inter um, yeah, light light transformations. Sorry. Um, a second one is more on an architectural scale with, with large transformations, and a third one is more systemic with, with the focus on, on the city metabolism. Um, I will show you some pictures. It, it's mainly references we found of that, that, that inspired us, and some of them are actual really reuses of, of underground uh, car parks. I will go very quickly over, over these pictures. So you see a running track, some agricultural programs, commercial showroom, and some temporary activities, um, bicycle spaces in Amsterdam, some underground Nordic ski facilities, box in box um, concepts that we used uh, for the students to, to work in, in the case of Mechelen, where we, we did our research. These are some of the examples that the students have made where they connected three car parks to a network of underground urban distribution hub. So this is all in the tactical, uh, in the tactical scenario. When we go to the architectural, level we first got inspired by light entrances as you see here some examples also folded landscapes to create uh, higher heights in these spaces some examples that you see here then combining programs such as in, in Le Halle in, in Paris where they combine the, the public transport and the commercial uh, program um, another one in, in Le Havre, which is also not a, a former underground car park, but it's an underground space where you see the urban dialogue between Oscar Niemeyer's Le Volcan, which is a cultural uh, cultural place, and the the city created by August Pere, uh, post-war period. This is actually a case study in Brussels of the first underground car park uh, constructed in, in 1958 where in 2008 2009 they did a transformation to a square meeting center so it's today uh, transformed you see some images here of the transformation where you see the removal of the intermediate floors as as discussed already due to the low load capacity um, this is a picture two pictures of, of the entrance of square today where you see during events it's a nice um, landscape stair in public space but when there's no events you see it's a deserted space which which leads to a first reflection on, on the management of public space in in those private um, managed uh, places these are more we have similar concepts i will skip this one um, there's also in this case in, in brussels parking albertina there was an integrated underground theater which is also renewed during this phase but i, I added the picture so you see the space before and after and then a second um, transformation of an underground car park we found in copenhagen uh, center for Renhold, where an underground car park was transformed in offices for city cleaning. It's really in the center of Copenhagen. And this is an example of what the students did in Mechelen. They introduced a columbarium in, in a former car park, which where was actually previously 50 years ago, there was a, a cemetery at that stage. So they brought it back to the city at this level. And then the third category of, of reuse, the systemic, where we, we go more into city metabolism. We were inspired by Eugène Belgros, 19th century waterworks. And on the right, um, in Rotterdam, the water square by, by the Urbanisten, and some other examples below. And then the second uh, inspiration we found in, in Nantes, Lenef, and in uh, parking space in Alken in Belgium for dismantling um, the constructions and, and removing all floors and creating new kind of, of public spaces underground. These are above ground, but it, it inspired the students for working underground as well. And this is what the students did in Mechelen. So they again connected three car parks into a water cycle with cool data center, as you see at the picture above. And they also dismantled a one floor 
parking um, and, and made it into a public space. And here, um, it's also on, on the Grote Markt in Mechelen, it's the, the car park is completely removed and, and the deepened park was introduced in, in this space. And then my final slide, um, some reflections. So we, we looked through a public space lens to these spaces because all the, the car parks we worked with are cent city centered car parks at very strategic locations in public space. So the three questions we tried to handle in, in the reflection was um, interest, who benefits by the spaces, access to whom are they available and agency who manages. When we look at these spaces today, we see a very monofunctional use uh, and concessions by private partners today already up to 50 years. Uh, we had one car park in Mechelen, which had a contract in 2016, which goes up to 2066, which is a tremendously long time. And then future pressures we see through this public space lens uh, from a neoliberal discourse um, the, yeah, the semi-privatization of public space or are we going for real Guinean public space? So it's, it's a political question that, that's at stake, I think, at this time. There's a speculation on sub-estate, as it's called, a real estate underground. And are we going to a commodification of, of public space? That's something we, we wonder today, which leads to my really light last slide. So we, we started the research with, with the question, what can be done with an underground car parks? And we ended the research actually by what should be done, and, and which is a, a nice question for a discussion, I think, what should be done, seeing these three scenarios that we have. And I will leave it here. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ralph, for that uh, that very interesting uh, overview of uh, what you've been uh, been working on, uh, uh, and and the, the the topic indeed of what can we do with all these underground car parks. I can remember from uh, from my own experience in the Netherlands when we looked at the uh, the planning of the subsurface. The only example that could be given was underground car parks, which then led to everybody wanting to put car parks underground, but. I think we're now already looking at, uh, at, at a kind of heritage, an urban heritage, which, uh, which into the future uh, brings us to the question, how can we actually reuse these, these spaces in a, in, in a different way? And uh, I'm sure we can, uh, we can uh, follow up on this in the uh, discussion later. I'm just wondering if there's anybody who wants to ask a quick question uh, to Raf at this point, or... Um, whether we will save that for later on so that we can just move on to the uh, to the next speakers just keeping a look on the time mario's already uh, sending me alerts as well so uh i do not see any raised hands or anything in the in the chat so i propose we move on to the to the next speakers uh, antonia good stuff yes i agree so after this uh, very interesting presentation on the adaptive reuse of car parks, we will have a presentation on pedestrian models, uh, pedestrian tunnels, excuse me. And uh, that will be co-presented by uh, Kayvan Rafi and Don Del Nero. Kayvan is the Deputy Tunnel Practice Regional Director for Western Canada um, of Hatch and has over 20 years of design and construction experience tunneling projects all over in Canada, in the UK, in Middle East, Australia and the United States. And he has a degree in mining and in engineering and a, also in industrial engineering. Um, and apart from his many uh, capabilities, he is also um, focusing on sustainability. Don Del Nero was until very recently the vice president and US tunnel director for Hatch Associates, and as I understand, has now moved to the uh, consulting firm WSP. Um, Don holds a minor in geology, um, in civil engineering, and is, has a master's in geotechnical engineering, and has over 30 years of experience in the tunnel and trenchless design and construction business. We're very much looking forward to hear from you both on pedestrian tunnels. Go ahead. 
Thank you, Antonio. Uh, do you hear me right? And uh, should I share my screen? Yep, all good. Thank you. Do you see the uh, presentation all right? Yes, perfect. Excellent. So um, as you know, um, the, this is the pedestrian tunnel presentation. Uh, Don and I will uh, will uh, carry this on, and uh, because we have uh, not too much time, we'll just go uh, directly to the presentation. So as you all know, bedroom communities uh, took root in the 70s through the 90s, leading to significant uh, metropolitan growth. And uh, along with this growth came traffic congestion and uh, long commutes to the workplace, uh, an issue that is uh, still a problem for our cities today, uh, but times are changing. Uh, urban congestion is one of the primary drivers in the social shift to more community-based lifestyles where individuals live, work, and play in the same location. In turn, there has been an unprecedented growth in trail system and pedestrian paths in many countries. However, the ability of this system to improve uh, communities' connectivity and mobility is often limited by railroads and interstates, which divide these areas, uh, which divide the areas they serve. So pedestrian tunnels uh, are one of the safest and most effective solutions uh, to these limitations. You'll see a few examples uh, from uh, on, on the screen. Next slide. Uh, so public use of underground space has become a common practice. Uh, underground construction provides a solution to surface congestion by introducing a third dimension to uh, limited two-dimensional urban surfaces, particularly in highly populated centers where overground space is limited and expensive. Uh, and one might think that going up might also be, uh, be an option to tackle the congestion issues uh, similar to the underground space, but there's a big difference. So it's the uh, above ground um, and going up is uh, that space already occupied for the most part. It's also very expensive, so it's not cost effective unless, to, unless, that, uh, unless you want to use it for residential or commercial buildings. It adds to the traffic congestion. It adds to noise pollution, light pollution at nights. Uh, more environmental issues, uh, the extreme weather affects the infrastructure and requires more maintenance. Any major fire or damage could be, uh, you know, transferred or shifted to other structure close by. So, uh, and, and many more reasons, uh, all, all these reasons uh, show us why underground is uh, the really only practical uh, third dimension to utilize. Uh, of course, when using under, underground space for low cover applications, uh, such as pedestrian tunnels, there are um, common issues to address, uh, including, but not limited to, ground settlement, interference with the adjacent existing structures, and construction impacts on resident lifestyles and traffic flow. Now, with that, I'll uh, pass it on to Don to take us through the rest of the uh, presentation with more uh, examples uh, from the uh, projects that he, acted, he he worked on himself. Don, go ahead. Thank you. Good morning and good afternoon to everyone. I appreciate your time today. Yeah, this is really the mode of the future. Um, for years, there's been barriers, as, as Kayvon alluded to, to um, this phenomena in, in society of living, working, and playing uh, in the same environment. And uh, long commutes are just no longer in vogue. So people are looking for places to live that allow them to, to uh, play and work in that same environment. And for years, in fact, there was a documentary on Sunday night uh, that I saw where um, years ago, interstates and and even rail what many interstates were put in place and, and major thoroughfares to, to actually deliberately divide communities um, and the, this this pedestrian tunnel concept is growing uh, across across the world there's hundreds and hundreds of kilometers of trails now um, which are traversing uh, major urban centers and uh, allowing again 
the the re residents to use and, and get together and, and experience community. We think of community as a noun, but in fact, with pedestrian tunnels, community is, is, is a verb. It's allowing residents to experience community with each other. And as you can see here, there's a, a great versatility of tunnels uh, that, that are out there and all the way from equestrian to, to elephants. Hopefully you don't have any of those in your urban centers, but there are some parts of the world that do. <laughs> so next slide. So again, to, to trail systems, uh, just, just when you look at the U.S. and Canada, uh, you're talking in Canada over 278,000 kilometers of trails um, that are in process, uh, many of which have been built already in all 50 states in the U.S. And this is the same if you look at any statistics across Europe, um, the use of trail systems has is, is become uh, in vogue. And, and to complete those trail systems many times, they're having to get through obstructions. And the most effective way to do that, uh, to avoid aesthetics is instead of catwalks and those types of things, it's, it's to go underground through, um, through pedestrian tunnels. Next slide. There is a great number of challenges with these though. Uh, most of them have very shallow cover. Um, they, they can be, if they're put in incorrectly, they can be unsightly uh, because they're going too deep to get that cover. So many times there's only less than a meter of cover over these tunnels and the ground dictates many times the means and methods and then you have the kind of the soft side of engineering um, obviously the ground is, is very important but the soft side of this 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 mode of transportation is really um, the permitting and and uh, the owner above the track the highway um, and they have many times de facto lining designs that have to be put in and sometimes the permitting of those crossings, the encroachment of the right of way can take literally six, eight, six to eight months. So even though design could be done fairly quickly, uh, an overall project like this, even a 50, 75 foot long tunnel, pedestrian tunnel can sometimes take a year to 18 months to get it finished just because of the permitting aspects. But I won't go through all these risk factors, but there are, are several that require consideration. Uh, I use the example of deep tunnels. We often, um, go deep for transit, uh, CSOs, various types of, of tunnel purposes. Um, but the reality is, is there's actually more risk in the shallow tunnels because of the potential impacts to the surface works uh, than there are for deep tunnels. Next slide. So one of the things I came up with uh, after viewing uh, across many areas and different countries is the fact that some tunnel, some pedestrian tunnels get used a lot and some don't. So I came up with this concept called the human tolerance factor rating system. It's a qualitative system, but it gives you a feel for considering uh, how long the tunnel is, uh, how user friendly the tunnel is, and simply the size of the tunnel. Um, if a tunnel is too small uh, and is not an attractive, uh, something attractive and aesthetically pleasing in fact, then it won't be used. So what for something that probably costs and you don't want to price these on a per foot basis but these pedestrian tunnels are anywhere from fifty thousand dollars a meter to a hundred thousand dollars a meter so they're quite expensive so i come up with this system to help owners understand that it's not just about the hard engineering that the socioeconomic impacts uh, must be considered and, and i came out so so that's the development of the system and i'll give you a couple examples coming up so here you can see just two simple openings underground. Just imagine these being underground. Um, on the right is, a, is an opening underground, one in which uh, a cave uh, years ago I, walk, I had to crawl through in Kentucky that was five foot high and, and 10 foot wide. And it was very, very uncomfortable as you ma imagine and very unfriendly um, to go through versus something that's, that's more, a little more comfortable and that is an opening underground that's five foot wide and 10 foot high. Uh, that tends to be much more attractive, although its narrowness is a problem. Still, if you had a preference, you would go to the one that's five foot wide and 10 foot high. And I'll show you some examples of, of that coming up. So here's a tunnel that wasn't well lit. Uh, it was a converted tunnel into a pedestrian equestrian tunnel, 600 foot long. But as you can see, if you're walking your dog or, or, or any, other, um, uh, any other use, then it looks like the end of a rifle barrel. And even though it's only 600 foot long, you can see there's a lot of places where someone could hide. Um, there's not a lot of aesthetically pleasing 
uh, elements to the tunnel. And really, in my mind, from a human human tolerance factor, um, the rating is unacceptable. Unacceptable. In fact, in, in going to this area, you could sell. You could tell that the tunnel, although very costly to put in, was was hardly ever used. Next slide. Here you got a much different situation. Um, it's it's a smaller tunnel, uh, one I've gone through, and this one's only 75 feet long. The aesthetics of the head wall are nice. Um, you've got you've got barrier, nice nice railings, nice plantings in the area. You've got nice brickwork laid down, brick paving, so um, much better rating. Although still small, when you when I've ridden through this with my bicycle, uh, because they use shotcrete untroweled. For the inner lining, if you fall on that lining, you get all scraped up. So, it's an uncomfortable rating, but but it's um, it's definitely better than that the, the last one, which was looked like the walking through the end of a of a rifle barrel. Next slide. Uh, here is a, a very large equestrian and pedestrian tunnel um, that I would say is comfortable. Uh, it's not finished, um, but you can see that. It definitely facilitates use, even with the little lighting that's there, uh, and you feel much more comfortable. This, they actually were going to keep the the lining as you see it for antiquity purposes. So, you, so a lot of times the driver for using these is it's it's aesthetic value to the community. And um, this was an area that uh, um, was a little more rural, but definitely uh, much more user friendly. So, from a size standpoint, and even the lighting. Um, it's much more comfortable because, especially because of the height of the tunnel to walk through. Next slide. Uh, this one's even better. This one actually is welcoming. It's a very short tunnel. Even though you've got heavy, class one heavy rail going over this tunnel, uh, you can see it, they've made it a community attraction, and that's a real plus. That's something that uh, you really got to look for in using these pedestrian tunnels and implementing them. Um, they've got artwork. They've put here, they've got railings, it's well lit. You can see the light posts, um, a, a very, very nice architectural light post put in place. So the features are welcoming uh, for this tunnel. It, it's it's very not very expensive to put in these wing walls and to put in this inside the formwork to put in various patterns that allow you to uh, look at the facade. And, and so ingress and egress in this pedestrian tunnel is very easy and very welcoming. Next slide. So with that, um, we had a very short time limit, but um, we'll open it up to any Q&A you might have about uh, implementation of pedestrian tunnels in, in your community. Super interesting, Donald and Kayvon. I think um, the topic of pedestrian tunnels is something that we all have um, some experiences with, um, some that we like, some that we dislike, and I'm someone who always pays attention to it. Um, so. Let's see if the audience has one very quick question. We will, of course, have the Q&A at the end. But if somebody wants to make a comment or a question now, um, there, there would be quick time for that. And if there isn't, then we will uh, talk about your schemes some more in, towards the end. Um, I'm particularly interested in the, in the topic, how can we uh, improve policy and planning to make these uh, pedestrian tunnels more user friendly and and also as you said um, get them through in the permitting processes quicker okay over to you Han uh, to introduce our next speakers let's uh, mute myself first thank you Antonia um, I would like to introdu introduce uh, Joyce van den Berg uh, to you who uh, graduated with distinction uh, as a landscape architect from both Larenstein College and the Academy of Architecture in Amsterdam. She works at the Amsterdam Municipality as a chief designer, and she's one of the co-authors of the publication Integral Design Method, Public Space and Biodiversity. Van der Berg gives lectures regularly and is active as a guest lecturer for the Academy of Architecture in Amsterdam and the Bauhaus Universiteit in Weimar. And indeed, Joyce, we, we only met a couple of weeks ago at Pakhuis de Zwijger in uh, in Amsterdam, where we uh, took part in an event that concluded a, a month-long exhibition at the Amsterdam uh, Architecture Institute on uh, on the use of the, uh, the subsurface, uh, which was very interesting. And uh, you will be talking about uh, biodiversity, which of course is a, is a very important topic, but 
Um, it is also important from the point of view that uh, the subsurface uh, in some re regions doesn't only consist of hard rock, it actually consists of uh, very much, uh, is very much alive, I would say, and that's something that cities need to appreciate and, and, uh, and deal with as well. I think that's about the nutshell of what you're going to present to us. So the floor is yours, Joyce. Thank you very much, Han. I will share my screen now. Let's see. I think it's shared. Do you see my screen? Yes, perfect. Okay, top. Well, it's an honor to be here. Uh, thank you very much. I will uh, tell, uh, I will explain something about uh, the public space and above and below it's called. And um, I will shortly, uh, briefly, will give a pitch around the integral design method, which we worked on in the municipality of Amsterdam. And I will uh, continue about healthy and vital soils. Uh, so how do we work? We work as a city, as government, uh, quite a lot with other kinds of cities and universities and knowledge institutions and ministries. So pushing boundaries, actually changing policies where we see it's needed because we are achieving livability cities um, actually end to aim that there are uh, as well sustainable. So we do that uh, quite a big network. Uh, and so that's also the reason that we're quite uh, working a lot with different kinds of cities and universities. So what is the integral design method? We, uh, we shorten it uh, in the Netherlands, uh, like EOR, we call it. Uh, so it's actually that we see that the underground, so actually the subsurface, we as well uh, claim to be public space because we have new kinds of systems going from next electric to all electric. Actually, we're uh, dealing with more electricity questions, data questions, climate adaptation, heat drive as well in the uh, subsurface, clean air, what has it to do with subsurface, quite a lot, and the materials as well. So we see it's getting more busier and denser, and especially in, in cities. Uh, so we are in lack of space. So how do we approach it? We approach it that we are really working on public space from the subsurface, the underground, until the facades and uh, the rooftops from above where it's possible, where we have new developments, knowing uh, to deal with data. So actually how we deal with that, what is the aim? Dealing with actually uh, when you touch an essence that you're a part of a whole system. So you have to realize that and that we are aiming as well when we are planning a new street or renewing street, uh, redesigning that we be, have to be aware of the contracts behind it and the knots and the dots which we have to combine to set the finance, the policy ready to go off. So, uh, oh, this is again the slide, it's twice extent. Uh, so we see actually that uh, there are quite a lot of uh, topics going on and uh, that we do with that. So it's really a, a big measurement of resulting uh, all these uh, topics. So we see that uh, with um, 3D uh, designing, uh, parametric designing, actually uh, we see quite a come forward with actually modular designing. So it's actually grasping like uh, Lego blocks uh, adding data to it so we know actually which kinds of scenarios of climate adaptation we can adapt in the subsurface and in the soil and in uh, the above ground. So these are some examples of new innovation uh, constructions, how we can uh, the efficiency better and the lack of space actually make it optimized. And actually that it's quite uh, better to sustain the whole city so we don't need to open the street over and over again. So these are some examples, utility ducts for the data and low electricity. Uh, the underground uh, waste transport with 70 kilometers an hour transporting uh, the waste. And as well that uh, we're talking about sort of explanation of layering transport heating pipes so uh, because in the lens we aim to get off the gas and we aim to go use of, for instance, heating, rest heating from data centers or kinds of 
So actually, uh, we work with uh, this uh, 3D and parametric uh, way of designing, so modular designing, that's very important, so flexible. So we're actually designing city, uh, the way of approaching is for flexibility. We design for flexibility, maximum, so not blueprints. And uh, this is a sort of image how we, as one example, how we touch the above and the below ground in one street as a typology, uh, how we can deal with uh, structures and how we can aim them and what is then needed for the policy. We come up to that later. And of course, except uh, cables, pipes, roots, and uh, of course, water buffering, we have as well the aim to be having that vital soil. And that's quite a new topic. So, and that means as well, not only uh, being vital in the soil, but as well being vital indeed to approach cities as mountains. So on the rooftops, we're talking about climate adaptation. So soil transportation to the rooftop is very important to bring up the microbes and uh, small animals to the rooftops and approach it in that science. So we see as well that in streets, in public space, uh, from uh, below to above, that we have different lifespan of assets and we have to deal with them. When we change a street, it's a new possibility to adjust and to innovate the street again. So actually on the left, we see here categorized in what's above the, uh, the street and what's below the street. And on the right side, it's in another kind of way ordering. So it means actually in the whole lifespan uh, from uh, who's the oldest one and who's the youngest one. So the circular spine. And there, those are very important to be connected as well that all assets have a sort of owner, maintainer, and uh, who's taking care of that, what is ex actually the lifespan. And these are depending on different kinds of contracts. So the contracts are really as well, almost mathematically a way of new designing as well to streets in a strategic way. And how we deal with that is that we talked about this modular and uh, 3D uh, designing, and we made a combination from all the uh, sustainable topics. So water, climate adaptation, flora, fauna, biodiversity, materials, in another world, circle economy, ground, soil, subsurface, how it comes together and how to make a bigger value in use and uh, prestige to put it forward. So we made a whole database, how you can make it more efficient. This is an example of one street. And here we go on the left, we see the aim on the, uh, below on the left, we see uh, what is the goal or what is the actually not the goal, but what is the meaning of the street typology, how it is situated outside now and how we want to achieve to a better prestige. And actually on the topics there we see on the right as symbolically, uh, including mobility, waste, flora, fauna, climate, uh, subsurface and uh, energy, of course, and dealing with uh, water management how to deal with this in the profile. So actually, uh, it's all a big puzzle. And one of the big aims as well is that we see that uh, by, by the first city, a matter of vital soil is very important and an underlightened aspect. So we published an extra uh, publication last year to address this uh, whole topic in the uh, municipality, but as well in the country. So we uh, showed that as well in the different biennales in Seoul and uh, Venice uh, represented this publication. And now we're actually dealing with all the people and the initiatives in the Netherlands who are approaching on all kinds of ways to deal with new, what is a vital uh, and healthy soil. So to be sustainable because Example, acids will break if we are having a too dry, too dry ground. So how to deal with that? And that's a big major question. So we do that now in collaboration with all kinds of parties. Uh, to come uh, back to that, it's actually, uh, what is a vital soil? What happened? Well, actually we're quite a lucky planet in that sense. So uh, we are lucky that because then after the Big Bang, 
there was this uh, actually microbes going out everywhere. And they go from the really small scale to something what we can see and uh, feel and touch. And we see that actually we have in lots of cities, lots of spaghetti, we call it. So this structure of infrastructure, but actually we want to make use of the data, electricity, et cetera, et cetera. So we are for standing for big tasks. That means as well, soil uh, degradation and uh, all kinds of habits. So uh, which are we uh, plotting and using in maintenance in our days in cities and out, outside. So it, we're talking about actually the whole ecological uh, network and cycle that it needs to be connected. So if we want to have the livability to, have, to walk into the shade during a hot summer, we need a healthy and uh, soil because the nutrients need to uh, go forward uh, through the mycelia to the roots of the trees. Yeah, this is something we skip. And we see as well, we made a connection with DNA research that we saw uh, that different trees in the cities are connected by uh, mycorrhiza and these mycorrhiza can even connect the cities. So what can happen in forests, we can uh, aim to be uh, to, to bring it forward even into the cities, so in the urban area. So it's quite fantastic new kinds of research. So this is something how we deal with the trees in Amsterdam. Go quickly. So as example, uh, to make it really concrete, to go uh, back to the integral design method, how can you treat a vital soil? Uh, uh, actually, there's this ecological metrics, soil management, water, and how to deal with that. So really concrete measurements. What can you do on small scale to the bigger scale in developments like uh, making a gap uh, in between the facades, the fences uh, to allow corridors and on management as well. Uh, do not always uh, take care of the leaves, so uh, keep them uh, where it's possible. And that actually we are aiming as well, that uh, we're looking from this uh, picture, we go to this picture, and that's actually a more uh, livable city where we have uh, more sustainability and flexibility. So if you're interested further, uh, our publications are all open source. It's also in English available and there's some movies we've made. So there's quite a lot of stuff which you can follow us. That would be to the openresearch.amsterdam and then integral design method public space. Or uh, if you're interested into the hard copy, you are free, of course, to uh, look it up into the NIE. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Joyce, for that uh, presentation. We realize that, uh, that we've given you uh, uh, limited time and you had a lot to tell us. Uh, and uh, I was astounded by the, uh, the graphics that you used in, uh, in your presentation. They, they, they were really cool. Um, I don't know if there's anyone who wants to ask a quick question now, but we're, we're rapidly approaching the, uh, the time when we're going to have a discussion. So unless I can see something happening in the chat or hand being raised, I will pass it on for now to Antonia to introduce our next and final speaker. Thank you indeed, Joyce, for this uh, amazing presentation on biodiversity and its important role in the subsurface. This brings us now to our next and final speaker, Matthias Vollmer. Um, Matthias is a research associate at the uh, Federal Institute of Technology, ETH, in Zurich. And he's also the co-founder of an ETH spin-off called Scan Vision, which deals uh, with 3D uh, surveying and visualization. They're using point clouds um, to convey complex space of form, which I think Matthias will share with us. And um, Matthias is currently pursuing a doctorate in the Institute of Landscape Architecture at ETH. And there he examines the relationship between architecture, infrastructure, and landscape, 
through visual media, including film, photography, and laser scan technology. And his presentation is called Perspectives on the Urban Landscape and its Underground. Go ahead, Matthias. Thank you, Antonia, for the introduction, and thank you for inviting. Let me quickly share my screen. There you go. All right. So, yeah, so great introduction. Um, thanks for having me. Um, I already know I'm going to be a little bit over the time. I'm already sorry for that, but we'll see. I'll, I'll give my best. So I start. Um, perspective on the urban landscape and its underground is actually um, maybe a more precise uh, description also of what I'm researching currently on. Um, it's the relationship between the urban landscape and its underground through audiovisual media, mainly point clouds. Um, so the significance of visualization is the main topic um, because I think understanding the underground by making it visible will actually also really help to develop it further on. Um, what you see on the picture is actually also the main project for today. It's the main station of Zurich city um, in Switzerland. Um, the material you see is a, a mix of material from the ETH research I'm doing, but also from the ScanVision um, exhibitions that we, are, that we have been doing over the last years. Uh, mainly the one that you can still actually look up in the National Museum in Zurich. There you can see an exhibition about Zurich showing also the main station. Okay, um, I'm going to actually jump over the main Swiss topics about underground. So I won't show you bunkers, I won't show you train tunnels through the, through the Alps. Um, also, this topic I'm going to skip, utilities. I'm really glad that um, Joyce did such a great presentation about this topic, really interesting. Um, I'm just showing this slide quickly to make you understand about the policy, the public policy of underground in the city of Zurich, but it's more or less the same all over Switzerland. So it's quite tidily organized. Um, every pipe has its room under the street, and that's where it has to go. Um, and usually it does go there, but not always, obviously. Um, <clears throat> so that's also maybe the main issue that um, if you ask about space in the underground in the cities, the answer is usually we don't have any space anymore. Okay, um, it's kind of a different topic. I won't talk too much about it. The result of this, uh, what you see here is actually this, right? So the visualization of the underground is basically lines. That's a utility underground um, map of Zurich. So I'm only showing here what's underground. Um, and that's how you should understand <laughs> the relationships of the underground in Zurich not really easy to read. I'm sure all of you know this kind of plans. Also interesting to understand is that landscape is um, visualized with some green dots. Um, also, this might be an issue. I included the trees actually in the underground map because as we just saw in the last presentation, uh, the vegetation plays a big role in the underground of a city. So it needs to be included in this discussion. All right, so my main topic is more uh, with another technique, it's point clouds. Um, point clouds are generated mainly by laser scanning. Um, for those who are not familiar with these technologies, laser scanning produces point clouds, so points in space. It's basically an information about the coordinate and the color. Um, it doesn't have a shape, so the point is the shape, but it can actually define a shape, obviously, by the accumulation of points. Um, but it's good to understand that it's really only information that we are looking at. So it's measured spatial information. So let's see that. Um, so by scanning a place, you can actually make something very interesting. You can record very detailed environment. This is not the most detailed. We see more detailed later. but you're looking actually into, ah, I, I don't skip the rail train, train tunnels. That's actually the new NERD base tunnel that we're looking at, 52 kilometers through the Alpine region. Anyway, um, the interesting thing is that you can actually really go trans scale. So you can look at details in the same model and then shift to a much more territorial view to understand the context of it. And this data is all actually recorded by more or less one scan. That was done at the portal. Okay, so point clouds, why is it interesting, especially also for underground? Uh, just a few words. 
Um, what you see here is actually a hydropower plant with the uh, integrated dam. That's the dam, what you see here. And below it, there is the hydropower plant. And what you actually see on the left side is the only access to this hydropower plant. It's an underground tunnel. Um, you take the lift, you go down um, about 50 meters, and then you access it through the tunnel. And as you can see now, the point cloud has a very interesting um, quality. It's always transparent because it's only points, right? You're never looking at a closed surface, but it's just a question of how dense the points are and the more opaque a surface becomes, meaning that you can actually use this uh, quality of a point cloud to show a multi-layered landscape so you can see through multiple layers within the same place that gives you the possibility especially also to show certain underground infrastructure at the same time as the overground okay um so in 2018 we um scanned the main station of zurich with scan vision um, to tell some stories about it and i'm just gonna let it run because otherwise i'm running out of time it's an audio visual piece um and it I will just lead you a little bit through this kind of infrastructure and discuss some, some um, topics of this place. So the main station of Zurich is actually, um, I guess, the second biggest uh, passenger flows uh, in the world. It's just uh, close behind um, Japan's uh, Shibuya station because in the main station of Zurich, all the trains and also the subways and all these things are coming together. So the densification of people is big okay um but there is a lot of stuff going on so for example in the 70s they built this highway tunnel that we are flying through now um, they built this highway tunnel um with the prospect of having the highway crossing in the middle of the city luckily they didn't build the rest of the highway but just this tunnel and as you can see now it lays in between the over and underground tracks and on the right side we will fly through it in a minute you can also see the river seal which is actually going parallel to this so interestingly enough um as you know in switzerland we we make new laws by vote and just this year we, last year sorry we, we voted about um, converting this tunnel into a bicycle tunnel actually connecting two areas in this in the city that are separate by the by the track field of the main station so that's the that's the riverbed um and then we come to the overground tracks and on the lower part of the image you can actually still see the the underground tracks we will come to that in a minute so the interesting topic about the main station in zurich is actually that it is a historically grown underground structure um, now we're actually passing down to the lowest point um, the issue for that is that the original train station is actually a historical protected building so is the the roof of the tracks and that means that the train station couldn't expand except for the underground and in switzerland the policy actually says or the government says that if you own the ground you also own the underground meaning that you can dig as deep as you want and so did the national railway company so they expanded step by step into the ground um, now on the final images of the main station from this uh, short edit we see actually a huge production kitchen so the the main station is not only a commuter place but there is uh, it's also the second biggest shopping mall in switzerland and there is a lot of restaurants including one huge production kitchen that are, we are flying through now so there is also a lot of people working within uh, the main station and obviously you understand now that the main volume of the train station is underground so they do work underground and in this case this is actually the critical limitation to the use of this infrastructure because the labor law in switzerland does not allow too much work uh, without daylight which makes sense for me um, but of course the the owner of this infrastructure um, has to find some ways to shift their people to over and underground work um, i'll just add a few more images of the main station um, this is a work from ScanVision that we added, uh, that we uh, handed in for the Biennale in Sao Paulo. Um, it was about everyday space, and I think that's what makes the train station so interesting. So it's everyday space, it's kind of a public space, right? And with this uh, tool of editing the point cloud, we were looking for an exchange between different perspectives on how this underground is actually used. Um, so we chose this idea of making sections and showing the multi-layered um, 
modulate facets of this place and then shifting into this um, first person view to give you also this kind of audiovisual impression of a human being being in this infrastructure. Let me check. Ah, yes. So, yes, I'll just let that run for a bit. So, we thought the this kind of project is a very good example to understand how actually the underground is becoming more and more an everyday space and that would also mean that the space needs to be designed and planned as something else than it has been until now we we know it a lot this kind of underground passages we had even the the, the presentation about it they need to have a certain quality and um, then they become really an interesting place um, even though they are kind of um, confined spaces, obviously, and they need some special treatment by that. All right, so now we go up again to the overground, um, but actually only to go back down. Um, the last example is um, also a shopping mall. I just wanted to show this example because it's a kind of a special case within the city of Zurich as well. Um, this is actually the underground delivery system of um, a couple of big shopping malls along the Bahnhofstrasse. It's the main shopping street in Zurich. Um, so they started to connect all this kind of um, shopping malls with the underground delivery structure. And as you know, they usually, the underground floor is reserved for the, for the food section and that's where we are now. So it's quite interesting how in this underground of the city of Zurich, slowly, slowly the food section started to connect um, to the delivery system. Now here we can see it in kind of a plan view section and I'm gonna just stop it quickly as soon as we are there to explain a little bit what we just saw. Um, so if I stop right here, um, so we can see here the, the Yelmoli shopping mall. Um, and then we can see how it connects to a kind of a, a maze of delivery and um, delivery, yeah, delivery channels and rooms that can host the material before it's entering the, the warehouse. And here we can actually see the canals that have been slowly um, extended towards this shopping mall. It was actually the last one who was connected with this one. And um, I think that's quite a a unique thing to see because actually in Switzerland, as we saw before, under the street, the place is reserved for utilities. And here they found an agreement that they can actually move the, the utilities to make room for, for maybe a, a larger use uh, for the underground by extending this kind of system. You only see a part actually, you only see the part that was accessible for one of our students. It extends obviously to, to some other warehouses here. And so it comes together um, to this kind of small network. All right, um, thank you and take care with this image of a glacier in Switzerland, which actually also has a very interesting underground created by the melting process. It creates this kind of holes. So please take care and thank you. Thanks a lot, Matthias. You blew us away with your um, scan vision data and point clouds and um, visualization of, especially I think in this context, super interesting, the, the Zurich Central Station being the second busiest worldwide. And we could all see what all these uh, levels accommodate. So, and this, um, I think we're gonna open up the floor, Han, right? Um, yep, absolutely. So over to you first, Han, if uh, there's already questions popping up or um, if you have anyone to the speakers. I am not seeing uh, anything happening in the chat at the moment. Uh, if anybody wants to join the dialogue, just just raise your hand and we will uh, will include you in the dialogue or give you the floor to ask a, ask a question. Uh, in the meantime, I would just like to to ask our, our presenters um, as this is about uh, about how uh, we can go about influencing policy in terms of uh, the, the awareness of underground space and maybe also the use of underground space. Do you can you say something about where you find that policy is lacking the most at the moment? And uh, 
I'll, I'll head over uh, to, to Raf uh, uh, to ask him uh, to respond to that uh, first. Raf. Okay, thank you, Han, <clears throat> for the question. I think uh, in, in the case of the underground car parks, I think policy is not and, and yeah, not really taking a lead in the discussion at the moment because the, the underground car parks are a, a business model and it brings a lot of money to the cities today and it, it's been so for, let's say, 20, 30 years. So it's difficult for them to change their their discourse to, to a real public space like, like a, a decent park because they are used actually to, to earning money in, in public space. So I think the risk is, is that new uses will again be in, in, in the same discourse of, of making money of, of those spaces. While before the, the underground car parks were established, it were just public spaces and squares without any, yeah, without any earning of money, except for some spaces which are, were um, uh, car, parking spaces on, on ground level, of course, but other than that, it was more inclusive spaces. And I think that um, policy makers today, they, they tend to, to not really take the front in the discussion because they have actually this agenda of, it's really a, a big income for, for a city. So to, to really change that, I think there's not really someone standing up in its own city to, to, to make that, that change possible. Okay, okay. Yep, thank you for that. Joyce, you mentioned something about uh, how your your methodology, how your approach uh, could could lead to uh, to uh, being adapted or changing maybe policy. Can you tell us a little bit how the uh, city of Amsterdam is looking at this now at the at the subsurface? Yep. Yeah, I can tell something about that. It's actually uh, not only the municipality of Amsterdam, but because we make the integral design method, we are collaborating now with 11 cities. So we're bounding, uh, we're bounding each other uh, with uh, the knowledge and, and that we say, yeah, now it needs to take action because we cannot achieve the aims and the goals of the international sort of um, uh, rules which we aim and that's actually for example the CO2 reduction x percent and for each country it's of course a bit different but uh, we cannot simply uh, in the practice we cannot achieve it if we're not organized in the underground in the subsurface so actually that was the main kind of thing so we're actually talking about it's a tilt in urban planning so it's totally uh, swift around so looking from the subsurface, the underground, to planning and going through the uh, above, that's one. And uh, we do that together. So on the level that actually we see European level, the, the level of the, the Netherlands in this case, we work with uh, the ministries. So actually with five ministries now together of changing uh, the policies on that national level, that's called the NEN. 7272, <laughs> so uh, adjusting cables and pipes uh, troubles, spaghetti ordering, and uh, on the level of, of course, uh, province and on the level of the policy, we're working as well. And we do that together with these 11 other municipalities. So big uh, municipalities, the big ones in, um, in the Netherlands, but also smaller ones, they can go faster forward because they have a little bit less bureaucracy if that's allowed to say. So um, yeah, this is how we do that. So, and this is a, a long, long shot, of course, a long breath, uh, but uh, we're working on that because we see really to make it very clear in each city, if you want to be in the other way around sustainable, that now how it's organized in the Netherlands, that we see all kinds of different programs. We've heard it from Belgium as well, other countries. And that you see that five, uh, five times each street in Amsterdam needs to be opened before 2040. That's totally ridiculous. We're out of lack of people, out of knowledge, out of money on that kind of thing, although we're quite a wealthy city. So we have to reduce that by way working on the policy level, but as well the way of how we collaborate together and we can bring it back to 1.2, 1.2. Uh, five 
times that each street of the in Amsterdam is open. And, and this is something with all the cities in the Netherlands is now happening. So we have to force, and therefore the integral design method, so it goes about circle economy, all kinds of stuff. Uh, so all the aims, what you need to achieve. So now I explained some little pie <laughs> about the water cables and pipes and the, the soil, but uh, it's all bound to each other. So there's lots of uh, stuff to uh, keep up and we do that together. Okay, yes, that's very interesting because I mean, I, I can really see how you're actually operationalizing some of the, the concepts, uh, including uh, Kate Drayworth's ideas on the, uh, on the donut economy or the circular economy. Aspects of that are coming back in, in what, you, what you showed us uh, uh, as well. Um, and, and I think, can I say that your approach is actually to to use these um, the, the the new ideas, but also the the needs that need to be addressed as the starting point, and rather have policy evolve from that uh, uh, than starting to think about uh, strategy and policies, and then hoping something happens in practice. You're actually doing it, and then saying, "Okay, policy needs to evolve based on our experiences and and what we're doing." Yeah, correct. And that's to, as well a new kind of way of working. But uh, yeah, then again, if we made the calculations and uh, we grasp uh, some uh, excels of uh, sort of what could you aim the first heads. Eh? For, uh, as example, the last heat wave, only green structure uh, in Amsterdam was 210 million had it costs because it was dying. So okay. this is one example, not even right. uh, energy transition. So there's a lot of to say about it, uh, to, to work in another kind of way. Okay. How, how important is it for your work that you can actually uh, actually visualize the, the, the subsurface? So, so maybe you can comment on what Matthias just showed us, whether that is, is that an enrichment for what you're trying to do? Yeah, we work as well with this uh, 3D point uh, clouds, and thank you. Uh, I especially liked it very much, uh, Matthias. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, really cool. And uh, I think it actually could be a really uh, good opportunity as well to go uh, accept uh, this 80 centimeters, but also dive deeper and to present uh, VKOs or other kinds of energy systems, constructions, and uh, especially in an old city, city center as Amsterdam, uh, it would be very interesting and for other cities as well. So I think it, uh, it could be from a big uh, opportunity. And uh, there's one thing I think is also very interesting is to make use of, because we're searching for space and there in the construction, there's also sometimes air. So I'm very uh, interested into that. So as well to make use of that. So new battery locations in the underground because you're already dealing with the construction uh, could be really uh, interesting. Okay. Uh, Antonia, do you want to take any questions from the floor? Yes, um, I see Nikolai Bobilev, you have a question or comment? Um, yes. Hi, Nikolai. Yes. Many thanks, uh, Antonia. Hi, everyone. Uh, congratulations on, as always, very interesting and inspiring event. And my question is to Raf. And uh, I, I again, uh, very interesting topic of uh, reuse of underground space and uh, flexibility of functions. And I wonder if you were working uh, with this uh, body of literature, which which is not 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 existing yet. I, I mean, this is my question because I, in tunneling underground space technology, we had just uh, one or two publications on uh, Chinese uh, quarries, uh, how they made a spa resort there and some um, mining facilities. But as, as I aware, there is uh, nothing uh, systematic on uh, reuse of underground spaces, but maybe I'm uh, missing something. Uh, is there any uh, kind of um, structured research on this or are you planning to do some kind of uh, classificate or some kind of information on, on how pressing this problem is, like how many facilities require development, how many are abandoned, what are percent of those in typical uh, European or American cities, 
Thank you. Okay, thank you for the question. Um, it's correct, as you say, there's not many literature to be found about it. Um, I can uh, recommend you the article we wrote. It, it's just about a week ago that it's published in Journal of Landscape Architecture, and it's open access, so that's something that you can look at. And for others, we started from, from architectural theoretical basis on reuse, because we, we also didn't found any, any literature on, on systematic reuse of underground spaces from the type that we were looking for. So the one that's um, the journal has to, to come out, I think, in two weeks, but it's already online with Taylor and Francis, and, and we made it open access. So you can already access the article. And it's, it's in Journal of Landscape Architecture. Great, thanks a lot. Um, I see a, a question in the chat from Mustafa. Uh, on certain registers, how could underground urbanism constitute an alternative to the challenge of urban sprawl in the future? Um, that's uh, a question that um, I would like to pass on to Don maybe, how it is um, feasible to do so in the US at this stage. Yes, if you, if you repeat that question for me again, though, very quickly. How could underground urbanism constitute an alternative to the challenge of urban sprawl in the future? Well, you know, the, the, I think the sprawl, in, especially in North America, I do a lot of work in Canada and the U.S., um, is beginning to wane uh, because of the fact that um, the commutes are just not tenable any longer. These long commutes uh, with gas prices, petroleum, um, which you know happens to be a bad state right now, but every five years or so we have one of these these problems. So I think there's, there's various drivers um, that are forcing people to look at life differently and lifestyles differently. And pedestrian tunnels are one of those modes that um, bring people together and allow people if you look at major cities like Chicago, um, there are, are major thoroughfares that tend to separate communities. I mean, if, you, if, you're, if you're a Chicago Cubs fan, you live on one side of the city. If you're a Chicago White Sox fan, you live on the other side of the city. Um, but, um, you know, those barriers and obstructions are being broken by the simple mode of, of pedestrian tunnels. So I think the more they become used, um, the more effective uh, life is and more efficient life is going to become um, in in urban centers. Unfortunately, for North America, I can speak to there is no policy relative to the minimum length of pedestrian infrastructure or pedestrian area uh, within a given urban center. Um, I don't know of a policy that exists. I, I do know that in terms of implementation to to reduce sprawl, um, it's very helpful to include. Uh, pedestrian traffic and community development planning. It's very easy to look at the typical transit, um, heavy rail that goes through a lot of urban centers uh, and, and uh, trucks, traffic, and those types of vehicle modes. But sometimes pedestrian, tr pedestrian traffic gets overlooked and it's much easier to implement the, uh, the mode of, of, a, of a, or the infrastructure of a pedestrian tunnel on the front end than it is the back end. Um, and also applying for federal, state, and local grants are almost a necessity for the city communities, these, these small communities, uh, and large city centers. Um, they don't; they just they're just so expensive, even though they're so short. Um, they're so expensive to construct that um, you, you've got to really apply for those up front before you start the letting process of of putting it out even to engineering. And um, I would also say that stakeholder workshops are very valuable to enhance the, the use of, of uh, pedestrian tunnels and, um, and to help circumvent and reduce the, the sprawl that's there. If people feel like they can get to the places they need to without having to always jump in their car, um, then I think you're gonna, you're gonna help in and in of itself reduce the sprawl. The other thing is I, I think it's important to meet with agencies up front to find out their de facto design um, that might exist and what governance they have in the right of way, their encroachment permits, as I said, can be 
pretty extensive. So um, I, I hope I covered it well, but um, I, I think there's many things you can do to implement pedestrian tunnels, but I would love for some major uh, institute or agency like the ITA to put out something, some studies of, of what, uh, what kind of minimum areas and lengths of, of pedestrian infrastructure should be per se, let's say per square kilometer um, in a city to facilitate people living, working and playing in the same area rather than working in one area and driving an hour, or an hour and a half to some suburban center that they, uh, they feel comfortable. I have an idea for you, Don. You could start a new working group within the ITA on pedestrian tunnels. This would be a real first, and I think it's a real important topic. Uh, one of my first jobs out of uh, planning school in New York was to work on, on pedestrian and bicycle schemes throughout the city oh. of New York. So uh, yeah, it is, a, it is a big one, and we need to find better policies. In the light of time, Han, you had a last question for Matthias, I understand. Yeah, I, thought I just want to put something to Matthias uh, just uh, for the sake of not missing out on him because, uh, I mean, he did give, a, give an interesting presentation. But Matthias, I was wondering, I mean, you do all these 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 scans, some of it you do uh, as research, some of it obviously uh, because you're commissioned to, to do it. But if we really want to start using all this this kind of data in, in, in policy, um, the question begs who owns those points that you are that you are creating and, and where does the data sit? Yes, um, yeah, thanks for the question. <laughs> um, anyway, um, it's a good question. Actually, in Switzerland, there is already this kind of open governance initiative going really strong. So there is a lot of uh, points that are for the public already. Uh, for example, all the air, airborne scans um, from Switzerland, you can actually basically download for your own use. And that's also what happens. And it really helps to, to develop some planning, but also some very new ideas that you can just do now because you have the data of it. Um, in Zurich, actually, they started to also do this kind of, uh, it's called street street space 3d translated to english um, where they really scanned in high resolution all the street facades and this will actually also have its influence on the on the policy making because now um in zurich they are starting to do the 3d ownership and this will also go on the ground i guess um, so they are starting to separate uh, the catastrophe plan in the third dimension um, which is quite interesting and there these points are coming into in, into the into the game because with the help of these you can really strongly define what's the property and and what's not right because until now you only had the footprint of buildings and maybe a height information and that's that's how it's going to change for now for example the the 3d street space is not public it's owned by the city um but i guess sooner or later this will become public um, again, it's a question of policy, uh, whether you can make this high resolution data just public or not. But I guess um, I don't really see an issue there. It's just a question of a, of a new law because of a new technology. Um, so I hope sooner or later this will be public data. Yeah. OK, so again, new law, new policies is mm. what we require in this field. Before mm -hmm. I hand it over to Antonia for some final remarks uh, and Closing of this, this Cyber Agora, uh, I just wanted to say uh, that uh, we will continue our collaboration with ISACOP, of course. Uh, Antonio and I are both active members of ISACOP, uh, uh, apart from being co-chairs of Ethicus. Um, we are looking at establishing a community of practice uh, on the topic of underground urbanism. And as Frank already indicated, at the beginning, there are uh, various uh, uh, events coming up the, later this year, uh, amongst which the uh, the World Urban Forum, uh, where we hope that we can uh, really uh, get the topic of underground urbanism, bring that to the attention of uh, of a wider audience. And uh, I really look forward uh, to to uh, reconnecting with some of you, uh, or all of you indeed, to see how we can uh, uh, keep in touch and uh, and and keep this uh, topic alive within ISACOP, but also within uh, the ITA uh, through eTickers. So from me, thank you. And back to you, Antonia, to uh, wrap things up. Uh, I, can't you, I can't thank you all enough. Uh, I'm really uh, deeply inspired by um, our speakers' inputs today. 
And I'm sorry we didn't have more time for discussion, like Olusola is uh, starting to ask about Sub-Saharan Africa now and, and what, it, what its impact could be in the use of the subsurface. So unfortunately, this is a, a bit too short the time today to answer that question, Olusola, but um, let's be in touch, everyone. We're going to have further cyber agoras or community of practice groups, as Han said. And um, I'm also happy to see that Don would be interested in starting a uh, working group on pedestrian tunnels in the ITA, and we will bring this uh, idea forward. So with that, uh, many thanks to everyone. Many thanks to Mario for uh, facilitating this. Um, on behalf of Mahak Agrawal, she's curated this event and is now in a plane for a family emergency. She had to fly uh, off from India today, so she couldn't be with us. And thanks to Frank Taunt for uh, welcoming us uh, so nicely in the beginning. Goodbye, everyone. And I think, Mario, you will make the uh, recording available, correct? Yes, in the next days, they will be available, yes. Excellent. Okay. Thank you Thank very you much.